Kids Company can best be described as a reparenting opportunity for children who don't have a functioning parent in their lives. And it's usually because the parent has been maltreated as a child and wasn't helped. But they go on to have their own children and sadly some of them go on to maltreat their children. So we receive children who've already run away from the family home and they turn to Kids Company initially for really basic things like food and somewhere to live. But or whilst we meet those basic needs, their psychological and emotional needs emerge and they usually cluster around uh, behaviours that are defences or consequences of having been severely maltreated. Just to give the public a sense of it, in Britain 1.5 million children are being abused and neglected and the social work departments have only capacity to take on 86,900 a year. So consequently what happens in very poor areas is the social work department can't take the cases and children are left to fend for themselves. it like it was yesterday. It was uh, as if my own energy was going to fry me like an egg. I remember looking at my hands thinking what do I do with this energy? It's so intense. And I realized that what I needed to do was to live my life outside the boundaries of my personal life. I, the kind of energy I had had to be expressed uh, in a bigger capacity than the creation of my personal life. And I think there was another thing that inspired me, which was my grandfather was an incredibly graceful man and he was a pediatrician. And I had this sense that through serving, he had acquired an understanding of quality that in some ways I admired much more than the grandfather who'd become a multimillionaire at 21 equally bright, equally effective, but he didn't have the grace of the one who was poorer, uh, but richer in the way he helped others. It's very interesting. You know, when you work with continuously maltreated children and in conditions where resources are really poor, the risk is that the workforce will become immune to abuse and over-familiar with it and they start grading levels of abuse, paying attention to the most serious and not paying attention to perceived less serious ones. And I think as a leader, what I've had to do is create a sense of vision in conditions where actually it's hard to be visionary. And uh, I've done that by trying to make my workforce understand that the abused child is our primary client to whom we're accountable. I've tried to put the children right at the center of our provision. And that quality, the delivery of quality, gives energy back to the worker. So I've tried to get my workers to deliver as much quality as possible, partly to meet the child's needs, but also partly to sustain their energy in their work. So in effect, we created a heroic organization, which at the core of it is this driver to deliver quality, but to our clients who are children, not to stakeholders. Everybody else is a secondary client. The child is our primary client. Because the children know that, what's happened is that 97% of our clients are self-referrals, so it's children at street level recommending us to other children and bringing other children to us. Uh, it's attention to detail, so 
when a child first comes on your premises, they're not uh, thinking of you as someone who can meet their psychological needs. They, they're looking for some really basic things like, is this place safe? Is it clean? Can I have my needs met? I try and get my workforce to really pay attention to things like uh, cleanliness, a uh, really good routine, the quality of the furniture we provide. And in those early steps, what research has shown is that children get attached to the fabric of the building first uh, before they get attached to any human being within it. And it's understanding that environments are signaling the quality that potentially your workforce is able to deliver or not. I, um, people always say to me, where do you get your energy from? Because, you know, I'm working seven days a week till about 11 o'clock at night. And I keep telling them I get high on quality, you know, and quality can be the delivery of compassion. I think compassion is enormously um, special when you get an opportunity to engage uh, with it. And it can also be the quality of what you produce. Now, we don't always arrive at the best possible uh, quality mark, but the fact that we're trying each time uh, it, it, it is what really recharges my batteries. I have profound love for the children, and if somebody gave me millions and said, go and do what you want to do, I'd be on the ground working with those children. I wouldn't do anything differently. But I think if you want to sustain your energy in conditions of care, knowing that you are attempting to deliver quality is the battery. You're right, Kids Company has about 500 staff and it has 10,973 volunteers. So it's a large organization. We reach out to 14,000 children a year. Some of those children receive multiple services and have multiple contact points. It's a very complex organization. And the secret is to make every worker feel like they are the heroic deliverer. And, uh, and the way to do that, and what I do is, I, first of all, I interview workers myself. I'm not interested in the job description. I'm not really very interested in their CV. I'm interested in them as a human being. And there are a couple of things I'm looking for. Their ability to form attachments, their love for children, and some kind of a skill, quirky skill. Like, I uh, hired the rollerblading champion of Italy. She didn't have a line or one bit of experience with children, but she clearly had the capacity to love. So I'm looking for the capacity to love. Then what you do is you put this worker in the work situation and you find their strengths and their talents. And then you give them permission to work for you through those strengths and talents. So you don't fit them into a job description, uh, but you turn them into a skilled parent. Now, in order to be able to give that amount of freedom to your workers, you have to really look after them. So every worker in my organization has one therapeutic session a week where the therapist is looking after their feeling life and they have one line management meeting a week so that we know that the work we need to get done is being done. But it's about really looking after the worker and uh, having regular meetings with the worker to see if they've got bored or they've got run down a bit. They need to be pulled away from the frontline service with the children, work in the back office. So it's constantly regulating your workforce and uh, being aspirational on their behalf. And when you do that with your workforce, that cascades down to the children. Uh, and my role as a leader is to treasure my workforce so that they end up treasuring my children. Uh, the children are absolutely 
my source of uh, inspiration and the driver for this. Uh, actually, you know, the, the reason I've lasted so long in such precarious working circumstances is the children. And what I've learned from them is, um, first of all, courage. They're incredibly courageous. So I attempt to be courageous on their behalf and will often say things to ministers and people like that, which is not in my immediate interest, but it's in the interest of truth. And then the other thing that I've learned from them is forgiveness, not holding on to the bad and uh, sort of munching over it. So I let go of the bad and forgive as much as possible. And I saw those children forgive the very parents who were harming them time and time again. I can't think of an act of forgiveness greater than that, to forgive the very people on whose care you're relying who end up harming you. So forgiveness I learned from them. And then a sense of humor, you know, just understanding that you're not that important. And I think often leaders become enormously preoccupied with preserving themselves. And the minute you do that, you become immensely weak. So I'm very in touch with my own insignificance. But equally, I'm, I understand then, when you really understand as a human being, you're really quite insignificant. You know, a minute a flood can come and knock you over, or a disease can not come and knock you over. You understand the potency of your actions because potency doesn't reside in the self. It resides in the power of your actions. So you feel enormously liberated because you understand it's not yourself you need to preserve or deliver. It's your vision, you know, your action. And because of that, I feel very free. I think strong leaders paradoxically have to pay attention to detail, but also attention to the larger space. And often leaders do one or the other. So for example, they set themselves up and they they think they're going to deliver a vision and that's just their sole role. But actually, if one of your workers, mother has died, it's just as important for you to make sure that you're sending some flowers and a note, you know. And it's being able to travel from the large visionary space to the micro detail of human interaction that I think sustains a leader in a powerful position. And then um, understanding, having courage to deliver the vision and bring your workforce with you. Uh, so your workforce are uh, seen as being as important as you.